Okay, so um, what I'm going to be talking today is kind of the applications of, of uh, mirrors and lenses, or lenses specifically, actually, uh, to your da daily lives. I'll be talking about how a camera works and how you're seeing me right now, uh, how human vision works. So um, while we talked about uh, converging and diverging lenses and, um, and we talked about uh, um, uh, concave and complex mirrors, um, the, one, the thing I want to start off here reviewing is converging lenses because it's definitely the, mo the more complicated of the two lenses and it's what I'll be using a lot today. So let me just review how that works. That's any lens that is thicker in the middle than on the edges, and what it tends to do is wants to converge light, so it wants to take light and channel it uh, into some kind of image. Uh, we have this thing called a focal length on both sides, and we also have a point that's twice as far out, sometimes it's called 2F, or in analogy with the uh, mirror, we sometimes call it C. Although I'll put it in quotes because it's kind of like ironic C because while C is really the center of curvature of the equivalent type of uh, mirror, it's not really generally the center of curvature of either uh, face of the, the lens. It's just a point that acts analogously to that point on the mirror. So let me just review what happens. I'll draw the uh, object in... Um, black and I'll draw the image in red, I guess. Um, so the object is over here, very far away. And the significance of the focus is that that's where the uh, lens channels the light from that object into an image. Okay. So when the object is very far away, the image is at F. It's a real inverted image and it's very small at this point can't expect a lens to work miracles if the object is very far away, then the image is basically non-existent, it's that small, but it is at the focus. And then as I move this in, this moves out and starts to grow. So the, again, the reasoning for that is that as you bring the object in, the lens captures more and more diverging light, and the lens has a harder and hard, harder time channeling that in, so it's, it can't get the image channeled in until further away from the lens. Okay? So as the image starts to move in, the object starts to move, or sorry, the object starts to go closer, the image starts to move further. And the significance of C is that when the object has moved into C, the image has moved out to C. Okay? So that is when they're equidistant. And if they're equidistant in distance, they are also actually equidistant in size. So as the object moves in to C, the image moves out to C and has now grown to be the same size. So I always call C is for crossing over point. And when I mean crossing over point, I mean for size and distance. So from here on forward, the object is going to be closer and the image is going to be farther and also now larger. So I might draw in something like this, and this will be like this. So at this point, the object is starting to be really close to the lens. The lens has a really hard time channeling that into an image, so it's, the image starts to fall pretty far away. And it's also bigger. So, um, that is the real image. These are all real images. They're all real and inverted. Those always go together for a single mirror or lens. And the big action happens when you cross over F. Okay? So if, I, if C is a minor point of interest, where that's where the crossing over point for size and distance, it doesn't change the general character of the image, which is the real inverted image. A big change happens when you bring the object to F, because at that point, the image has moved all the way out to be infinitely far away. And in fact, what we've done 
is we've broken the ability of the lens to converge the image at all. We're too close now. We're too close to the uh, lens. And what happens is that the object's light that is uh, now so divergent, it cannot get channeled into an image over here. In fact, uh, what happens next is that the image takes the opportunity to jump to the other infinity. So when it gets thrown to one infinity, it emerges from the other. And then, just to finish the summary up, it moves inward, and at the end, they merge. So once you're done bringing the object up to the lens, the image ends up catching up with it and being there too. And that's converging on what I call pane of glass behavior. Okay? So at the end, they have to merge. Because if you stick an object on a flat piece of glass, right on the inside, it's going to look like it's exactly on the inside. Because at that point, the shape of the thing starts to not matter. We're just looking at the basically the flat aspect right in the front. And we know that when we look through a flat piece of glass, where the object looks like it is, is really where it is. Okay? So that's what we remember is that for mirrors, we always have to wind up with no matter how crazy the shape of the mirror, when you get stick right on it, we have to wind up with plain mirror behavior. And any lens, no matter how crazy its shape, when you stick the object right on it, we converge on pane of glass behavior. Okay? So that's just a review of what happens. And again, remember when it's over here, this image is virtual and upright. So we have these two uh, regimes with wildly different types of images. Whenever the object is outside of F, so when the object is outside of F, we get a real inverted image. That has significance because we can capture it on a film or on a screen, as I will show you, and you will do in lab this afternoon. You can actually put something here. You, can, you guys will not have a film capture it in po for posterity, but you will have a white screen where you can literally put something and get to see the image. Whereas if the object is inside F, then we get a virtual upright image. And that cannot be captured on a screen. So you'll get to observe one of those as well in lab today, but you can't capture it on a screen. Um, the reason why, at least for today's, uh, or at least for the lab, is pretty obvious. What if you tried to put a screen here while well, you're going to block the light from coming into the lens in the first place so nothing can happen, okay? Because it's on the same side. So um, we want to generally avoid this when we're trying to form some image like on a screen or a film or the back of your eye. We, we want to focus on real inverted images. Um, in fact, this right here is something we want to avoid, um, as I will show you, um, in those systems. OK, are there any quick questions about this review before I jump into how a camera works? Okay, so let's just jump into that. Okay, so a camera. A camera, at its most simplest, is just the converging lens in a box, okay? Converging lens. It has a box. The old film cameras, you would just place some film on the back of the camera like so. It's not so different with today's digital cameras. It's just a digital array that instead um, captures what would have been captured on a film before. So the only thing that film really is, is is a type of uh, uh, chemical 
where it's light sensitive, so depending on how the light hits it, it instead of just having the image there for the moment, moment, it gets permanently etched on it, right? So then there are bells and whistles, like for instance, you have an aperture so that it only lets in light for a split second. If you let light in for longer, the picture wouldn't be blurry unless you had it on a tripod and held it really steady, and then you could get a nice time-lapse picture. Um, the main thing that's important is for this distance to be adjustable. So you have to be able to control how far the camera lens comes out, and really, um, it's mainly to make sure that the distance between the film and um, and the lens can be adjusted. So generally speaking, there's a fixed dimension and then there's a movable dimension, but it's all in the service of either creating space between the camera and the film uh, or closing it, okay, so adjusting that. So let's take a look at why that is. Well, let's say you want to take a picture of some distant mountain vista, okay, so that's something that's going to stand in for being really far away. And the light coming from that is essentially parallel. That's going to enter the camera lens, like so. And we know that when light is coming from really far away, um, the image tends to fall off the focus. If it was truly infinitely far away, it would, the image would have no size. But of course, the mountain range isn't really far away, infinitely far away, which means that um, it falls slightly past the focus, and it's not zero size, but it's quite a bit smaller, which is good because, you know, the whole mountain range is way bigger than your film, okay? So you, the fact that it's smaller is a feature, right? So there, basically the image is at the focus, and you want to make sure that your camera is such that the image falls on the film. So you get a nice uh, magnification is less than one, so you have a uh, reduced uh, inverted image, which is of course real. The images do form upside down, so when back when we had the old film cameras, it, when you had to load the film in there, it was always a cool little trick. What you do is, as you're loading in the film, you put a little nick on the negative, and you will see that that nick that you might put on toward the top of the camera comes out on the bottom of the negative. Okay, so they are inverted. They, they can be taken like this. Okay. Um, so then, let's say we want to use the same camera to uh, take a picture of something close by. Here's a flower or something, you want to take a picture of that. So light from that is, of course, going to be significantly more divergent. And since light captured from that flower is significantly more divergent, now the camera lens cannot converge that quite so close. It can't converge that the focus, it falls past the focus. So here's the focus the image is going to fall past that. Now, I'm greatly exaggerating here, but you get my point. It looks like that. And, oh, I guess I should have left it up here in my summary. Um, so, whether or not the image is smaller or not, it really depends on where you put it. If, in this case, I'm having that the uh, flower is still beyond C, right? So anything that's beyond C, it'll be smaller still, okay? But I could have, instead, I, maybe that you have F here and C here, that would be okay. But then you would end up with a larger picture of whatever it is, right? Remember that, that when you have the object between F and C, the uh, image is larger than the object itself. That's okay if you're taking a picture of something really tiny, right? Because then it can be bigger and still fit on the film. 
It really just depends on what you're taking a picture of. So you're taking a picture of something close by, depending on if it's still beyond C or between C and F, it'll either the image will be smaller than the object or larger than the object itself. But one thing is for sure, it's going to fall past the focus, right? And so what we have to do, if the camera box itself looks like this, we're going to have to create some space here. So you notice that now the camera lens has to push out from the back of the film, or from the back of the camera. Okay. So there has to be more space from the lens to the film because a closer the object means a, the image falls further from the lens. And of course, you're always trying to chase that image, right? That's where you're trying to put the film so that it doesn't go blurry, right? You have to put the film or, or, the, or what, what have you, whatever's capturing the image, you have to put it where the image actually is. So, of course, the way that we create this space, we don't literally leave the lens in place and pull the back of the camera, it's, it's the, the lens moves forward, right? So this is a thing where you can try it, especially on like um, autofocus cameras, right? So you have those cameras where you hold the button halfway down and, and it focuses for you. That's kind of a nice opportunity because it means that you don't have to look through the viewfinder to see if it's in focus or not. Um, you can just bring your head outside and just look at what the lens is doing. So try taking one of those cameras, point it at something really far away. Notice that the lens goes in. And then try pointing it sort of something close by and you'll notice that the lens comes out. So why does the lens comes out? come out? Again, it's when you're trying to take a picture of something close by, you need to create more space between the lens and the back of the camera. Because as the object is closer, the image moves further past the focus. Right? Have any questions so far? Yeah? How does a pinhole camera work? Um, pinhole camera actually works in a different way than what I've talked about here. Obviously, there's no lens involved, so I don't want to get into that at the moment. So. Um, the other thing, yeah? When they refer to millimeters of zoom, what is that referring to? Um, that's a good question. I, I assume what they, they mean in, in terms of the, the lens itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, is that uh, um, a, another lens that you add in? Or is that like just the property of the lens itself. Yeah, it, like if you had an optical zoom lens, mm -hmm. it would go from say 18 to 70 millimeters. Uh, that may actually be referring to the this range, right? So uh, some of the zoom lenses you see that they have like this like long thing like this, so like a little like long tube. Yeah. That may be giving you more distance and then telling you how much it's adjustable, right? Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but that would be my guess. Especially you see a lot of these. Uh, lens attachments that are fancy, they, they have some size to them. You wonder, couldn't they make them smaller? But the size is kind of important. Um, the, uh, um, the other thing I should mention is that if you bring, if you have that the focal point is here and you bring something in too close, you'll never be able to take a picture of that. So for instance, if you have a bug crawling around in your camera lens, no matter how hard you try, you can't take a picture of that in focus. It's too close, okay? Because the light from this is so divergent that it cannot be converged at all. It, it does some, maybe something like that, but that traces back to a virtual image over here, and that's not where the film is. Yeah. So every camera has a, what, a near point where if you try to take a picture of something closer than that, you will not succeed. Okay? So no matter how cool that uh, bug is or whatever, if you put it too close, you won't be able to get a clear picture. Okay. Um, so that's how uh, a, a kind of a camera generally works, is it, it takes a fixed lens, we're assuming we can't swap it out, we have a fixed lens and we're just adjusting the distance between the camera lens and the film, um, but in our next order of business, we take a look at the human eye, obviously 
you don't have your lens popping out of your eyeball. So there's got to be a different way to that you do this when you're looking at things. Um, and the short of it is that instead of changing the distance, you change the lens itself. So your lens has is is negotiable as to what its uh, focal length is. So let's talk about that. Human vision. So if you're going into biology or any kind of uh, pre-health, and this is something that's uh, pretty close to uh, the stuff you'll study in the future. Um, first, let's just talk about how, generally speaking, the eye works. Um, your eyeball, First of all, it has a shape that's like this. It has a bulge in the front, and this bulge is called the cornea. So what is this bulge? Well, um, if you make the assumption that you have your eyeball out in the air, like you most of the time do, where n is about 1, and then, of course, your eyeball is not full of air, it's filled with liquid, where n is greater than 1. Variously, the vitreous and atreous humor, for those of you that might be aware, or if you want to just call it eyeball juice, okay, it is just some material, mostly water, um, which has a higher n value than 1. So we might drop in, say, uh, a couple normals here. So those would be normals to the surface. And if we have that uh, light comes in, let's say parallel light just for the moment, we know that when light is going to go from air to a higher index of refraction, how does it bend? Toward the normal, right? So all things bend toward the normal. So this bends toward the normal. This bends toward the normal, and this one, well, this is at zero degrees, so that doesn't bend, right? We learned that the bending is only starts when the incident angle is greater than zero. And so what you can see is that you get some convergence of the light just from this cornea that you have at first. This is The cornea has a fixed shape. So what the cornea does for you is it gives you a fixed amount of pre-convergence. So uh, you get a... Uh, a bit of fixed, I'll call pre-convergence. And the reason I call it pre-convergence is because um, there's going to be a further adjustment to this light. Obviously, we can't just have this fixed amount of convergence be all there is, because we need some adjustable ability to go between near and far. So this would only give us the ability to see with one single distance, and that wouldn't be very exciting. So the cornea is kind of where the party starts. I should mention to you that there is a surgery that you can do to change the shape of the cornea. You can either make it more, so you can take it and you can slice it off like this. That would make it more rounded and that would give you more convergence. So that would be more convergence. Or what you could do, you could take the cornea and you could cut out a segment in the front and give you less convergence. You can make it more rounded or less rounded. Does anyone know what this is called? It's called LASIK, right? So that's what they're doing when they you get LASIK surgery is you're carving off your cornea. Okay? And they figure out, of course, exactly how much would be the good amount for what they're trying to do for you. Okay? In fact, I'll address wearing the old-fashioned style, wearing glasses, in just a moment, and we can kind of tie this into that. Okay? So when you carve it like this, you get more convergence help. When you carve it like this, you need less convergence help. Okay? So um, that, by the way, is uh, that's just kind of a little bit on the, the basics. Um, 
I should mention to you that when you jump into the water, if you jump into the water without some goggles, of course, what you're going to do is, well, let me do this in a different color. So in water, of course, the end value is, uh, starts to be greater than 1 as well. So pure water is probably still not going to have as high of an index uh, refraction value as your eyeball juice, because your eyeball juice has lots of other stuff dissolved in it. But I do want to point out that while you might still bend, you still bend toward the normal, not as much, right? Because the end value is not as, is, is, uh, is not as, as extreme, right? So you, if you jump into water, that throws things off. That's why your vision goes blurry, right? Your vision goes blurry because your normal refraction from air into your eye is not occurring. It's one that you're not used to at all, of course. And you certainly, um, um, evolution has favored that you live on land, okay? So what you do if you wear goggles, for instance, if you want to be able to see it clearly underwater, you're just basically carrying a pocket of air around in front of your eyes. I should make the point that fish, of course, are expecting water here, and everything for them is set up for water to eyeball refraction, and a fish vision would go blurry if it came up into the air. So a fish should wear, if they had fish goggles, they would be little goggles that have water in them, okay? Because it's all about what refraction are you used to. And if you get something different, then you're not set up for that, okay? Okay, so, um, let's take a look at the next part. Inside your cornea, you have the lens of your eye. So the lens of your eye, that's squishy, and the shape of that lens is negotiable, and we're going to change the shape of that lens as needed. Uh, there is a set of muscles called the ciliary muscles, which will work to change the shape of that lens depending on where you're, whether you're trying to see near or far. Okay? So that's where the rest of the action happens. That's where the adjustment happens if you're looking at things near versus things that are far. So it takes the fixed amount of pre-convergence from the cornea and adjusts further based on your particular needs at the moment. Okay? So um, this is obviously a more complicated situation. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of uh, draw some pictures where I simplify the model a little bit, where I don't draw the cornea, I'm just going to pretend that it's just the lens of your eye. Okay? So I'm going to draw a simplified picture where I have just the lens of your eye, and I'm not going to draw all the other bells and whistles because if we're doing just conceptually, it'll work just fine. Okay? Okay. So here's how normal vision should work. You're looking at something distant, like this mountain range, we know that um, light that's coming from really far away, basically the image goes to the focus. Maybe it's not quite infinitely far away, so the um, image falls slightly past focus, but basically out of focus. And we want that to be at the back of the eye because the back of the eye is like your film, right? That's where your image capturing stuff is. Okay. Does anyone know what that area at the back of your eye is called? Optic nerve. The optic nerve is what relays information from where the image falls. The retina. Um, so, we have a normal relaxed eye, and what we have is that, uh, that the um, object is far away, the image is, falls at the focus, and you want the focus at, your back of, at the back of the eye. Be 
because you always want the image to be where at the back of your eye, right? So you always want the image at the back of your eye. All right. So if you have a normal, uh, healthy uh, eye, that's what happens when you look at something far away. Um, the image falls right at the back of your eye, which is where the focus is. Well, how is it then that you might look at something closer when you have something that's closer? The light is more divergent. And if we draw your eyeball, eyeball is still pretty much the same. Okay. If you didn't do anything, the focus would remain here, but the image would fall past it, right? That would be your image. That's not good. That looks blurry. So, of course, the way we solved that in the camera was just to move the, and create more space between the lens and the back of the, 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 in the film, right? We can't do that here. So here's what we do instead. Your ciliary muscles engage, and they change the shape of your lens, and they make it into a more extreme shape more football shaped. So I'm not going to get into the exact anatomy by which that works, but these muscles somehow engage and cause the shape of your lens to be more football shaped. And the, what they do is they literally, because you're changing the shape of the lens, you'll change where, the, how long, big the focus is. In fact, if you bend the lens into this more extreme shape, then the focal length will be shorter. This lens is more powerful. It can converge uh, images to a focal point uh, that's much closer. So in this case, we've actually moved the focal length in. I call it <coughs> call that f prime. <coughs> now, that doesn't mean that the image is going to fall in, right? The only time that the image can fall at the focus is when the object is really far away, and this object is not far away. Still, the object is going to have diverging light from it, and so the image is going to fall past. So we have to draw it as falling past. But hey, in this case, the past, the focus, is good. So if we move the focus in, then the image overshooting it can still be at the back of the eye. Okay? So here, what we do is we engage the ciliary muscles for if the object is closer. The image will always fall past the focus, no matter what the focal point is, but we move F closer, so I'll, I call that F prime, so that falling past F prime can still be to the back of the eye. Does that make sense? So focusing, if, fall, if the image falling past the focus would otherwise be a bad thing, we make it a good thing. We move the focus too close, so that when, or move the focus closer, so that when the image falls past it, it's to the right place again. That's a little clever trick, right? So now we're negotiating not the distance between the lens, the distance between the lens and image point that we desire is always the same. So what we have to do is we have to negotiate the focal length so that no matter what happens, that is always going to be the image distance, right? 
We want the image distance, bi, to be fixed no matter what do is. So do is variable. So if you look at our master equation, right, 1 over do plus 1 over di equals 1 over f, if you don't want to negotiate on di, if that's got to be fixed, but this can be different depending on whether you're near or far, well, something's got to give, and of course that's f, right, the focal length. So if do is different, then this is different. F must be negotiable. And that's what we do with those ciliary muscles. So I guess what I should have, I should have probably put a similar equation for the camera. For the camera, this is for the camera. For the camera, we can't do anything about F. It's a fixed piece of glass, its shape is non-negotiable. And so since we want to have these be different, we want to be able to take pictures of things both near and far, then we have to negotiate the eye to be different, right? So that's where we have to create less or more space between the lens and the back of the camera. So it's just choosing which one of the things we're going to fix, right? We want DO to definitely be negotiable, right? We want look, things to be look at things which are both near and far, but then it's just a matter of which one you've got to pick your horse, right? For the camera, we picked a fixed F, so we have to be able to change the I, whereas here we want a fixed eyeball depth from lens to the back, and if the DI is going to be fixed, we have to negotiate the F, right? So again, this is for the I, for the I, the I is fixed, but F is negotiable with the ciliary muscles, whereas over here, with the camera, it's a fixed piece of glass of a given shape. F is fixed, so we negotiate the I instead. Okay? So that's how a normal I should work. Let's take a look at common uh, uh, um, things that could go wrong. See a couple people in this room wearing glasses. Let's talk about how glasses work, nearsightedness and farsightedness, okay? Um, are there any questions before I do that? Okay, so let's do it. I'll try to leave these normal eye things up as long as I can. Uh, let me take a look at uh, nearsightedness first. What if you are nearsighted? Okay. So what does nearsightedness mean? The, the common uh, mnemonic is, of course, you can't see near, but you can't see far. Okay, so it, it sounds like just a polite way of saying it, right? It's saying what you can do, you're nearsighted, instead of what you can't do. It's, it's more polite than saying someone's far blind, okay? Now that's just a mnemonic. It's not why it's called that at all. I'll show, I'll show you why you're, it's called nearsighted. Um, so let me show you what happens with someone who's nearsighted. Anyone here nearsighted? Okay, so let's take a look at what's happening. So we'll go ahead, start by drawing the eyeball. And uh, let's see what happens when you try to look at something far away. So this is what you can't do, right? So what's the problem? Well, your eye's supposed to be relaxed, right? And ideally, your focal length would be sitting here at the back of your eye, that's where the image is falling, that's what should be happening. But when you're nearsighted, the reason why it's really called that, okay, all mnemonics aside, this is just a mnemonic, okay, it's because your focal point is too near, okay? It's like this. Your eye is relaxed and your 
and your focal point is too near. It's too near the front of your eye. So it happens like this. Near sighted. So, you might say, well, let's, let's think about those muscles, right? What, can, maybe we can use those muscles. We're, we're not supposed to be. We're supposed to be perfectly relaxed. But we're, what if we engage these muscles? Well, that is not going to help. It's going to make the problem worse. Because when you engage those muscles, you move the focal point further in. It's already too in, OK? So here, um, the focal point is already too near, hence the name. Focal point too near, okay? And um, engaging the muscles won't help. Because having F prime even nearer would make the problem be worse. By the way, um, oftentimes the manifestation of engaging these muscles is squinting. Right? So when you try to engage these muscles and the muscles around them start to go as well. So you start to go like this, and that will not help. Okay? It'll make things worse. So, um, relaxing your muscles is the best chance you have, but again, not going to happen, right? Because just even in your relaxed eye, this is relaxed, the focal point is already too near. Why is that? Well, it could be lots of things, right? It's hard to know who to blame, okay? Maybe your eyeball is too long. Maybe your lens is too powerful, right? And the focal point is just too aggressive. It's some combination of these things, right? Something went a little bit off at some point, okay? We'll talk about how to fix it, okay? Um, I should mention that, generally speaking, relaxing your eyes is the best way to see, to have hope of seeing far. That, of course, that's how you normally are supposed to see far, uh, is your perfectly relaxed eye can see things that are very far away. You may have had this experience. Maybe you have no, you know, you don't need to wear glasses, but maybe you've been sitting there looking at something close for a long time, flower or your physics book or whatever, and you start, I start to get tired. These muscles have been engaged for a long time. So have you ever had your eyes kind of glaze over, right? So whatever's in front of you goes blurry, and you find that you're looking at something far away instead. That's basically your eyes protesting about the use of these muscles and saying, I don't want to do this, let's do this for a while, okay? So the idea is if you want to give your eyes a maximum break, you should be looking at things far away, okay? Not things that are close by. Um, so that in someone that's nearsighted, no matter how relaxed they get, the focus is still too near, nothing's gonna, nothing doing. Um, so then you might say, well, there's obviously some problem here. The focal point is too near. How can they see anything well, um, they can't see near because here's what happens. If you start to take a look at something closer, so their focus is somewhere here. At some point, remember the image falls past the focus for, for, for objects like this. So at some point, it falls far enough past the focus that you can see that again. So at this point, you can see it. That's where the can see near comes from. But I want to point out something, is that you are basically relying on the fact that the image falls past the focus. Your eye is still relaxed here. It's not doing anything. It's not engaging these muscles like it should, right? You're supposed to engage these muscles to see something that is near, and you're not, OK? So here. You are uh, not using the ciliary muscles to 
So here's what you have. You have a problem. This is not good for the health of your eye. And the reason why is you can't see this anyway. So why would you engage your muscles? Because that's just going to make it worse. And over here, you're supposed to be engaging them to see things that are closer, and you're not. You're just relying on the fact that your focus is already too near, and now the image is falling far enough past it that you can start to see it again. So you're going to have problems with muscle atrophy. Okay. So muscle atrophy is a basically what you're looking at if you don't wear your glasses for a long time, if you're nearsighted. Your muscles just sit around like they're on vacation. Has anyone, uh, of those of you guys that were nearsighted, have you ever like forgotten your glasses for a day or something like that when you put them on? It's like, ah, ouch. It like hurts to put them back on a little bit. Like it feels like eye strain. I guess it depends on how bad your prescription is. But for me, I don't like to wear my, I don't like to go very long without my glasses at all. And the reason why is if I've had them off for a while, I put them on, my muscles are like, Oh man, we were having a nice vacation. Now we got to work again to see things that are close by, like we should. Okay. So there's a bit of uh, muscle atrophy that you get when you're nearsighted and you don't wear your glasses. So let's give ourselves a little prescription. So what kind of uh, help do we need? Now remember here that we're already converging too fast, and the focus focal point is too near. So if we needed some help here, should we use a converging lens or a diverging lens? Any ideas? It's already converging too much, too fast. We need diverging, that's right. So we get ourselves a nice little diverging lens. And for any of you who have diverging lenses, or you're nearsighted, your glasses are thinner in the middle than on the edges. They do a good job of disguising this so they don't look ridiculous like that thing I just drew. But I assure you, if you carefully peel on your glasses the thinnest parts in the middle, and they're thicker on the edges. I know for my, uh, for my prescription, the edges are quite thick, and they do their best to kind of hide that kind of on the inside of the frame. Okay. So what that does is it gives you a little bit of diverging help. So it kind of goes like this. It does a little bit of pre-divergence. And of course, if you diverge the light a little bit, then your very aggressive short focal length lens of your eye will, it will mean that the image will fall past the focus. So you can basically see that what's happening is that if the light from a far away object is coming in parallel like this, what we do going through this lens is make this light look like this light, which we were able to see, right? right? We can see light that diverges a little bit because that shoots past the focus. That's good. So what we try to do is make this light be the kind of light that you can view. Now, if we, of course, you don't have to uh, only put on your glasses when you're looking, trying to look at things that are far, what happens over here? Well, if you have a diverging lens, that you're wearing on your face to look at near things, that's going to diverge the light even more. Now you might say, well, what, wait a minute, we could see that before. So why do we want to mess with that? Now it's going to make it fall even further. Well, now you can use your ciliary muscles like everybody else to bring that back in, right? Because remember, you were coasting and you were doing that without using your muscles. Well, maybe you should now use them. Because remember, that's the exact same issue that anybody has. When someone's looking at something that is close by, the image tends to overshoot the back of the eye if you don't do anything. That's why your eyes glaze over after a while if you're looking at something close by. So what you have to do is kick in those muscles and bring that in. Okay. So now, you can see this. Okay. So you can see far with the glasses, and 
And then instead of not using the ciliary muscles, you have to use them for close by objects. Just like anybody else. Okay. So that is the prescription for if you are nearsighted, you get some diverging lenses that you wear in front of your face. Uh, you can wear them all the time. You should wear them all the time. They help you see things that are far away by pushing the image further back. The image is falling too near. Diverging lens helps them fall further back. And when you're close by, to prevent them from falling too far back, you engage your muscles like everybody else. Okay? So there are a variety of ways to manifest this divergence. This divergence helps. You can wear these little pieces of glass in front of your face, glasses. You can get contact lens that you stick on your eyeball that are also going to be of a divergent shape. Or you can literally carve up your cornea with LASIK to make it so that it's more divergent. So you can adjust that amount of pre-convergence that you're getting and make it a little less aggressive with carving the shape of your cornea. So that is nearsightedness. Are there any questions on nearsightedness before I do farsightedness? Okay, so let's do that. Um, I guess I'll go over here. So again, farsightedness, it sounds like a polite, polite way instead of it saying you can't see far instead of saying you're near blind, okay? So you uh, can see near, but you can't see far. No, wait. Sorry, I got it backwards. You can't see far, but you can't see near. Again, that is a mnemonic. That is not why it's called that at all. It's the far has to do with that your focal length is falling too far. It's too far back. Okay. So let's take a look. Here's your relaxed eye attempting to look at some distant mountain vista with basically parallel light coming in. And now, in your relaxed eye, remember, the goal is, in your relaxed eye, the focal length, the focal point should be right at the back of your eye. And nearsighted, it's too near, and farsighted, it's too far. So it looks like this. Might be like this, F. Objects that are far away, the image falls into focus, and that is now too far, it's past the back of the eyeball, too far from the lens. Wait, I thought you said you can't see far. That's right, you can't. Or sorry, you, you can see far, and I'm going to show you how is it that someone might adjust. Well, what you see is someone uh, squinting. And the squinting is basically, they're not supposed to be engaging their ciliary muscles, but they have to because that's the only way they can see this. So what happens is they engage these muscles, and, and they shouldn't. And at some point, they are able to move the focal point in enough so that instead of being too far, it's closer and at the back of the eye. They're not supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to have your eye being relaxed, okay? So the problem here is that um, you, you engage those muscles to bring the F in but you're not supposed to. 
And that is how you can get away with seeing things that are far away. All right? But that's going to be a problem when you try to look at things which are even more closer by. So if you try to take a look at things that are closer by, the light from them is already very divergent, which means that the, it's going to fall past the focus already, maybe something like that, And if you really engage these muscles, and I, I don't know how to represent that, I guess I'll drop like this, like that, okay? Big time, okay? Remember the whole ideal is that you're supposed to be, for close objects, you're supposed to be moving the focal length up, closer to the front, so that when images shoot past it, they shoot to the right point. Well, here, you might have spent all of your muscle already just moving it to the back of the eye. So if the best you can do is to maybe move it somewhere in this neighborhood, okay, maybe you can get it to the back of the eye, maybe you can even get it a little bit closer. But still, if the image is gonna fall past the focus, there's only so much you can do to rein it in, right? There's no amount of muscle that you can have, exert that's strong enough to bring the image back to the, the back of the eye, right? You're, you're far-sighted, right? But you're far-sighted means the image tends to fall too far, tends to fall too far past the back of the eye, and the nearer the object is, the further it will be, the worse the problem will be, and at this point, there is no muscle strength. I guess I'll put it like this, the muscles aren't strong enough to bring the focal length in enough such that when the image which falls past it is at the back of the eye. And that's why you can't see near. And I should point out, in the meanwhile, we have the opposite problem with the muscles, right? So before, with nearsightedness, they tend to get lazy, right? They don't do their appropriate amount of work here. They're trying way too hard. The ciliary muscles are, never have a chance to relax. They're supposed to be relaxed here, but they're already engaged. Just so you can see anything, you can see things that are relatively far away, and then there's no amount of, of exertion they can get that they can do close enough to bring uh, the image into something you can see. Okay? So the problem here is eye strain. Just out of curiosity, is, uh, is anybody here uh, farsighted? definitely more uh, common in older people, right? We need reading glasses, okay? So, um, the reason it's more common in older people, by the way, is because if we're talking about overworking muscles here, right, for older people, what we might consider no big deal is overworking their muscles, right? So this is why this tends to be more common as you get older, it's just all your muscles go, including your ciliary muscles. They start to not be as what they once were, okay? So let's do some, a prescription here. The focal point is too far, right? So what we want to do is, the image is falling too far, we want to give a little bit of convergence help, right? We want to do a little pre-convergence help If we put that converging lens in there, go 
Well, we can take the strain off the muscles that are trying to do that same thing, right? The muscles were trying to, to make the image fall closer, and now the convergence help is going to get us there instead. Okay. So you may just wear that um, for uh, when you want to look at something uh, close by when you need the most convergence help, right? Because that's when the problem is really starting to fall too far back, right? When it's starting to really fall, for, fall too far back, that's when you really need the convergence help. So many times people will just use them for reading glasses, right? This idea is that here is where the muscles are going to go nuts and, you know, you're going to pull a muscle here trying to look at something. So you put on your reading glasses, but maybe here you have enough uh, exertion here in your ciliary muscles without the, the help of the glasses to see far things, okay? So you often find that people that are farsighted, they tend to just wear reading glasses or something like that for looking at things that are near. When they're looking at things that are far away, they might take them off. Okay. Um, the uh, other thing you start to see is bifocals. Um, for bifocals, uh, invented by Ben Franklin, they used to literally have like a, a metal frame in the middle, right? So you have one kind of lens on top and one on the bottom. What that was for was through the top, of your glasses, you tend to look at things that are a little further away. So you need a little bit of convergence help. And then through the bottom, you tend to look through the bottom of your glasses at things that are like much closer, like reading a book. So then, light's really coming at you like this, you need a lot of convergence help. So it was a little less converging on the top and really aggressively converging on the bottom. Okay, now that's just functional, right? You tend to just use your glasses to look at far things through the top and closer things through the bottom, right? You normally don't read a book like this or look in the distance like this, right? But that's purely functional, right? We still have bifocals around today. Almost no one has the, the piece of uh, metal through the middle. They just make it all as one piece of glass where you literally will find that the, the, the shape of the, the lens is such that you have more, uh, less converging help on the top, where you tend to look at far away things, and then very, a lot of convergence help through on the bottom, where you're looking at really close things. So those are some common things, nearsightedness, farsightedness, bifocals. You can have something called astigmatism. So what that is, obviously I've been drawing all this in a vertical plane, but there's obviously eyeball over here too. It's possible that you have that vertically, you have everything all set, you have the right shape of lens, but horizontally you have a different one. Maybe you have a curvature that's more appropriate in the vertical dimension, and then a really tight you have a curvature on the horizontal dimension, basically the lens of your eye is shaped like a football. Okay? If that's the case, you can more easily see Vertical lines and then horizontal lines. There's something out there? Things keep on flying around. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of plastic like, balloons or something. Oh, okay. Um, so anyway, uh, for astigmatism, the way that they test you is to literally show you horizontal and vertical lines. And, and you can see some vertical lines and focus better than horizontal lines or vice versa. They uh, will give you some glasses that will have different adjustments in one dimension versus another. So there's a lot they can do with this stuff now. Okay. And that's called astigmatism? I believe so, yeah. There's also some other stuff that have nothing to do with this, like just cloudiness in there, glaucoma. There's lots of things that can go wrong in vision, um, some of which can be fixed and some of which cannot, right? But if you just need to change the amount of convergence or divergence help, you have glasses, contact lenses, LASIK, right? Um, are there any questions on that? Okay, so I think that covers um, all of the, the uh, applications that I wanted to talk about. 
So I think let's just uh, call it a day there. Um, and then rather than me spending a few extra minutes talking about the, the next topic that I'd probably have to review anyways, uh, since we have um, a, a few days before our next lecture. So, okay, so that's it. Have a good break. Thank you.